Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special time, an extremely special day in Canada. Uh, today is the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, and I'd like for our special guest to introduce herself. That would be me. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Cynthia. Uh, my name is Madam, which means snow. Um, my English name is Karen Ann Mores Nee McIntyre. I was born and raised in Metlakatla, Alaska. I am Simsian, Haida, and Yupik. I'm Gunhada from the Raven Clan, House of Gishbegwada, Killer Whale. And I'm also my dad's side from the Gitwagults tribe of Lakolams here in BC, Canada. And I just wanted to thank you guys for bringing me on and being a little flexible to my schedule. I've had a lot of things going on today. I bet. Um, I also want to uh, respectfully acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded land of Kwantlen, Keitsi, Semiamu, Swasson, and Matsqui, on which I work and play. The Métis people who live and work on the various traditional lands I am on today. So we, we are so honored to, to have you here today, Karen. You're, you're a friend of mine for, we call each other besties. <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> And we're we're here today um, to learn to learn from you about um, about this day. Um, so, Kathy, why don't you say hello? I know we're just we just all want to sit back and learn from the experts that are out there right now. Hi, hi. Um, I'm thrilled to have you uh, on today, Karen. And yes, I'm glad we were able to work it out on our schedule. And uh, today is truly a special day. I've been watching um, a few of the celebrations going on throughout our province um, on the television and um, doing a lot of reading and acknowledgement and um, understanding more. Um, this whole week, actually, being a teacher, we've been embracing it. We had a orange shirt day yesterday in our school and we were all wearing our orange shirts, which is great. And um, yeah, so I'm thrilled to have you here. Me too. Thank you for inviting me. I've, I've had to learn myself about truth and reconciliation, um, having moved up here to Canada in 2006, now calling it my permanent home. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, well, I'd say a majority of U.S. schools weren't teaching this, let alone anything regarding Canada. You know, you, you knew they had a queen and, and you know, you kind of had the gist, but mm -hmm. having raised uh, my last four of seven kids here in Canada, I, I learned a lot more and having uh, worked at the Township of Langley, Lower Fraser Valley Aboriginal Society in Langley. Um, I'm now with Métis Family Services. I also do a lot of volunteer work, but oddly in, the, in my free time, I do a lot of studying and research. Um, right now I'm doing a lot of research on um, the Métis. Um, mm -hmm. I was very unfamiliar with the Métis when I moved up here. Um, and it's been kind of funny that um, I'm doing more and more work with them. And now it's, it's my job what I say for my, my retirement job. So I'm always um, educating myself mm -hmm. on their culture because I, I grew up indigenous Simpson on, on the only federally reserved in Alaska. And growing up there was much different from what I've heard um, from my cousins here in Canada. Being on an island, we're very isolated, but we were able to keep our culture. So um, we were the majority of population there. I know there's about 1400 people there now. Um, I've had several uh, friends and family move here to Canada. Um, I have a very good friend of mine, Michael uh, D'Angeli uh, is coming in as a professor at University of Fraser Valley. So I'll have someone from my hometown moving closer, which is nice because nice. she's a new baby and I used to babysit her. So <laughs> I'm very excited to see she and her family uh, move up here. Yeah. But um, I had discovered as recently as um, this morning that my own uh, grandmother on my mother's side from Alaska went to a residential school in Oregon. Oh, wow. Um, which was uh, Chima Chimawa. Um, I had to look it up. I had to Google the school because I'd never heard of it. I didn't know I had a direct family member that had gone there. And we didn't really hear about it um, because she passed away at the time my mom was nine years old due mm -hmm. to heart conditions. So I've never personally met her. Um, and then my mom lost her father when she was 18, right after she graduated. So then she ended up going to an all-native school, uh, Haskell, which is in Kansas. 
because uh, she couldn't afford to go to the college that she wanted to, and that was a free school for natives at the time. So she went in there and got her uh, secretarial training. Mm -hmm. Now, the real uh, story of uh, residential school hit home when I had married um, my kid's father, Corey Mores, who's a Simpson artist. You know, that's one of his works behind me. Um, because his grandmother went to residential schools mm. and the negative effect of that had trickled down so severely through the families that it's still there. It's still an issue. And his uh, one brother who's a year older than him was part of the 60s sweep. So it, it, it starts to hit you personally when you realize um, how close to your family this is still affecting. I mean, there's PTSD, there's, uh, there's abuses, um, which, you know, those that try to tolerate the abuses they grew up with that had trickled down end up having addiction issues. It's just kind of a reality of how people are dealing with it. Um, there's so many people that so many government wants to throw money and try to address the issue or the addiction when they're not providing well they are now finally but i don't know how many indigenous families are taking advantage of the free counseling that's available to try and work through it and address it and come out with some um, positive ways of dealing with it mm -hmm. it's really sad to hear the really um, detailed stories of what the families went through and i was shocked to find out how many families just never had their kids returned that that's just amazing um as we we both live in the same well um you live just in surrey actually up from my office here and yeah. i live in langley and today um of course at double day robert double day park is the it's it was it was tough to drive by there today but i slow purposely down where they have the crosses and up till yesterday they had little outfits on yeah. the crosses and today, all the clothes are taken off the crosses and there's orange tags um, on each one of the cross and just to kind of stop and go, wow, wow. And the question that I have for you, Karen, is what, somebody asked me this morning, I was at a networking event this morning um, as well, no, I love to network. And somebody says, what does this day mean to you? And I said, I believe that all our senses are now going to get engaged because we've all seen things, but now we're going to hear, we're going to touch, we're going to smell, taste, like all the senses. And I said, and it's the language. So as someone who can help educate us, what is some of the language? So we don't have this sense of ignorance coming from the knowledge we don't have. So help us there. Help, help I, I think, yeah, I think a lot of people um, who want to know more are doing the right thing. They're researching, they're asking the questions. Um, I think the, the hardest um, people to try and pull in the conversations are those that are saying, why is it important to me? You know, that was generations back. It doesn't affect me now. It's affected the generations around you that you're dealing with on a daily basis. So it's, you have to realize the grief that these families are feeling and knowing that, you know, their ch child was buried somewhere on a, on a residential school property, never returned. No one listened to the families back then. Kids were just taken and they were allowed to go home at Christmas provided the parents signed a written contract that they would bring the child back after the holidays the, because they were worried the kids would not come back and the parents had to be held responsible. A lot of the children had passed away trying to escape the abuse of residential schools and, and died in the process of trying to get back home. So this wasn't so much, you know, oh, you'll get over it. You don't. I mean, I, I personally don't have, you know, my kids that have gone through this process or um, a generation ahead of me that had gone through the process. But to learn about the atrocities of these families and what these kids went through, and it's, it's horrific. You know, not to say that all religion is bad. This was something that was brought into play by the government and certain religious sects had come into that and were, were paid to do these schools and basically, as they like to say, whip the Indian out of the kids to make them more you know, human. And it, they were 
tortured. I mean, my I know my hometown when they were in Canada were treated this way in Mount Lakala, BC, that you were um, hit and punished if you used your own language in your school because you're supposed to be learning English, which is one of the big reasons why a large population followed uh, William Duncan from Mount Lakala, BC to Mount Lakala, USA. And eventually our traditions were brought back we didn't have it as severe as some of these residential schools, which I'm, I'm grateful that my generations moved away from it all. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't completely escapable as, you know, originally my tribe's Canadian. Um, we lost some of the language, some of the traditions in the process with they're, they're trying to revitalize. It's just one of those situations. Um, it affects everybody on some level, whether you're indigenous or not we had um, an elder come in to counsel our social workers at Métis Family Services because we deal with families that are going through traumas and addictions and um, you're seeing that face to face. I had to transport children of visitations. And it was heartbreaking to have to bring these kids back to their foster parent at the end of the visitation because you see the parents are just broken um, having to say goodbye. So when you're actually doing that as as a job and then you find out people were voluntarily doing this and taking kids and knowing the things that happened and then being a parent and you'll never see your child again and a lot of the kids that had returned because i've heard a lot of stories some of the kids that returned back to their communities um, after they had supposedly graduated from the program um, we're seen as outsiders. They lost the tradition. They lost the family dynamics. They lost the language. Um, they were brought in back into their family. At, they, they appeared as an outsider by the time they returned. And that was the whole goal of these residential schools um, because um, Indigenous families are very closely knit. We are very closely knit in communities and clans and had a full network um, in dealing with not just our tribes, but the tribes that were near us as far as trade. And they, that was the only way they could see to break us. But even though we've been through, you know, the worst part of it, um, just the recognition alone is good to hear. And I think some Indigenous people actually take offense if you ask them a question about, you know, and you don't want to offend, you're just wanting to know. And I think it's important that, um, those that are willing to talk about it, educate the people that are asking because they actually want to know what, what's going on. How do we feel about this? I mean, I myself, you know, it's, it's easy for me to talk about it. Um, but if I were to sit down in a quiet room myself, I'd probably break, break down tears knowing um, that's not something I would be able to face. Just having someone show up at your door and drag your children away from you when you don't know what's going on. And then you have to get permission to just have them home for Christmas. So I think when it's brought into perspective of what was happening, um, I am glad that they're trying to pay some restitutions for the 60s sweep. I, I honestly think it's too little too late. Um, but I, I think that they're actually acknowledging it. I love seeing people recognizing the um, ancestral and seated territories they're on, that, that, that makes my heart happy. When I see any organization or anything on TV that does that, that means we're finally breaking through those barriers and making people recognize mm -hmm. they're surrounded by indigenous property. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's, um, that's a step in the right direction for sure. Um, knowing uh, you know, we recognize it between the beginning of every one of our meetings, beginning of our concerts, being a teacher that I am. Um, I've been very aware of many of these things because of the way I was brought up. I've been very connected to um, Aboriginal beliefs and traditions um, throughout my whole upbringing. And what's astonished me and surprised me is how much more I'm still learning and I think that's key is for us to continue educating ourselves. I'm reading a book right now to my father who is in a care home and nonverbal, um, not able to walk, sit up, eat on his own or anything anymore. And he, we're, I'm reading um, an Aboriginal story of a woman in Northern Ontario who brought the CBC radio to the community. 
and she's learning the two languages in that area. And it's, I beg my pardon for if I don't pronounce it right, Ojibwe? Ojibwe. Yeah, did I say, do it right? Yeah. Ojibwe, and I can't remember the other language because I can't read it. Because uh, a lot of these languages, you can't write down. It's an unwritten, uh, unwritten traditions. And yeah. it's fascinating listening to the story of the elders and Wa, um, the Indian Act. I I had to report on the Indian Act to my colleagues a couple of days ago, and there were some interesting facts. And we're all sitting there going, "Wow, I had no idea." And then I have colleagues that were on the other side of it, receiving the information, and were asked to, as teachers, to deliver the information. But we don't have the tools to deliver the information. How can we? We haven't lived it. We haven't experienced it. And then there's the tremendous guilt. You know, for a while, I went through a whole period. I'm sure, Jeanette, you felt somewhat the same way. It's like, wow, I'm a descendant of that. We're horrified because, yeah. you know, so that so it's a much bigger and it's it's a bigger picture. It's not just residential schools. It's the whole picture. And it's a lot to take in. So I'm with you. I'm really glad that we're finally coming to recognize it and it's in front of um i've read some apology letters by some powers that be and i won't i'll you know i won't mention who they are but i was quite frankly kind of horrified that i was seeing these apology letters from certain bodies is because wow like i had no idea i thought these people were above that and would act upon that and of course my my, my um my uh Sister's a foster parent for the Aboriginal from the Shishwap. And uh, she's had, well, she's got a second foster son now. And just hearing that side of it and her working with the system and, oh, it's such a big picture. It's such a big picture, Karen. I, I don't know. It's, I'm glad we're in this right direction though. Really am yeah. glad we're in the right Yeah, direction. it's, it's going to take, you know, numerous more decades yeah. um, for that to happen. I mean, I, I grew up, thank God, in a community of, uh, surrounded by my family and all Simpson. Mm. And um, I didn't realize that I was any different from anyone until we would leave on vacation. And uh, one year, my dad, I think I was about seven or eight, and we took the BC ferries. We were going to Victoria for a vacation. We took a whole month off every year. And we're on the ferries. And my dad wanted us to go to dinner in the front in the dining room. We're standing there, and at the time, I was the only child. My sister came 11 years later, and um, they wouldn't allow us in there. And my dad got extremely upset. This was one of the reasons my dad left Canada and moved to Alaska, mm. and then just kept our family there. Um, I'm standing there, and the, and the guy that was um, seating people said, oh, well, there's a little cafe at the other end of the ship if you can eat there. And my dad's looking around. He goes, there's hardly anyone in here. Why won't you let us in? And he goes, sir, there's a cafe down the hall. Yeah. My dad was furious. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, I don't mind eating in a cafe. I could not understand why he was so upset. And to be honest, they never explained to me. It was something that came to mind much later. Mm -hmm. um, because growing up in the community that I did, surrounded by my culture and my own people and all my relatives, I didn't know I was any different than anyone else. To be honest, you know, yeah. you go to university and everyone asks, you know, oh, are you Hawaiian? Are you Hispanic? And you're looking and I'm like, no, I'm from Alaska. I'm, I'm Simpson. And they look at you and they have no idea. Is that like Haida? No, I'm Simpson. I said, I am part Haida though. And Yupik. And they go, what's Yupik? I said, you call them Eskimos. Because <laughs> trying to get into any more detail was, was just, yeah. um, it just seemed tedious. Yeah. Uh, always having to explain who I am, where I was. Um, but having looked back on that whole situation with my dad and my mom's trying to calm him down and we did end up going to the cafeteria because they absolutely refused to let us eat in the dining room. And we never took the BC ferries again after that. Wow. We just wanted nothing to do with it. The Alaska State Ferries were much more understanding and, you know, they didn't discriminate like that at oh. that time. So. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I know that it was there. My best friend when I was um, in grade one, uh, kindergarten in grade one, was an Indian. And I got bullied no end because I was best friends with this person that lived just down the street from me. We had a great time. You know what? Now as an adult, I realized she just disappeared. 
the whole family just disappeared. And now I think, wow, I think they were pushed out of the community, you know, from the pressure. And I, I, that's terrible, but I used to get you know, bullied like crazy. Cause you know, that, again, it's the way I was brought up. Everybody's a human being in my, in my life. Yeah. doesn't matter where they're from. I was lucky. I didn't get that kind of treatment when I moved away oh. and went to university. Um, and I went to the, they had um, Indian resource programs there. So I can always find counselors and, mm. you know, tutoring, anything you might need was available at the university of Washington at the time. Mm-hmm. And I, I graduated out there and spending 18 years in Seattle after I graduated uh, university of Washington school of medicine. And then I came up to Canada, um, found out I couldn't, couldn't practice up here because oh. all of my certification and licensing was through the American Society of Clinical Pathologists. And wasn't recognized. Yeah. Not at all. It would cost me about 7000 up front to start the process to start the bottom when I left in a management level. So I just thought, you know, I have, luckily, I had three university degrees. And I said, I really could start another career. I said, I did what I did running Seattle Hospital laboratories for over 20 years. I said, I could just jump into something else. And I found... Um, I just love working with people. So, and I like helping people. I, I don't care what race they are. I don't care their uh, economic background. It was just one of those things that makes me feel really good inside mm-hmm. in um, doing that. So I started with the Township of Langley. Then I started uh, my own volunteer work in supplying homeless. Um, it was just something I really wanted to do. And I've tried to pass that on to my kids to help others, regardless of yeah, the background. Yeah, that was a question right? that I had, Karen, mm-hmm. is how are you, because oh, I know your kids, how are you raising your, your kids to be A, proud of their heritage, B, being, for the lack of a better word, an ambassador to others to, to educate, to be there, to answer these questions that we've had of you? Because I grew up in the culture, my kids have not they have to be taught. Okay. Um, my older uh, three kids that are now full adults, they're 23, 25, and 27. I had them in dance groups. Um, I was a mass dancer in, in a Simpson group in Seattle and um, was a dancer since the age of nine. So I grew up knowing the songs, the music, the performances. Um, and my oldest son that's here with me now, who's 20, um, he was an infant when he was dancing and tied to the front of my chest. So he doesn't remember as much but I think it's important to slowly um, teach them their background. I mean, they, they know their Simpson. They know, um, they know their Raven and it passes from the mother. It's just something I have to gradually teach them. Whereas I just thought, how do you not know what you are? I know what I am. I grew up and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm the mom now. <laughs> and you have to be taught this stuff. So I'm, I'm trying to teach them. My kids are starting to pick up. I know my youngest one asked me one time, I, w- I was caught off guard with something. I went, la. And he goes, what's that mean? And I went, oh, um, I said, it's a shortened version of Shemelgit. I said, and I, it's shortened. It means like an element of surprise, la. And so I'm trying to explain it to him. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, this, I feel really stupid having to explain this to my kids. So I'm trying to let them know that, you're Simpson. This is where you come from. You have to learn to pronounce Metlakatla. You have to pronounce Simpson correctly. So you shouldn't be ashamed of um, telling people who you are. Um, I have my 16 year old said she gets mistaken a lot for being a mix of Asian. And they're shocked when they find out she's indigenous. I said, well, I said, the thing is you're Simpson. I said, but you've taken more of the Yupik from your grandma's side, which is why people think that you, you might be a mix of Asian. I said, it's the eyes. And she'd always roll her eyes. She goes, great. And she goes, I have to tell everybody what I am now. I said, your brother had to do the same thing. I said, it didn't help that he took um, Japanese all through high school. <laughs> I said, they just assumed he was a mix of something and Japanese. And his best friend was from Japan. Um, I said, you know, hang out with whomever you feel comfortable as you should always clarify where you're from and what it is that you've grown up with I said I'm not expecting you to know um every Shemalgate word we have like I'd say a handful of fluent speakers of our language my sister's one of them um who's teaching Shemalgate language um up in Anchorage Alaska wow 
her classmate, Michael, whom I was talking about, had gotten her master's degree at UBC. And she will be teaching up at University of Fraser Valley. I'm so excited to finally have some family closer. And I remember them all as babies. So I'm, I'm glad that there are some generations that are willing to learn where they came from. Um, I think um, some of the ignorance from my hometown comes from not knowing our Canadian history, where we originated from, because they moved in 1887. When I graduated high school in 1987, we were called the Centennial Seniors. We got all kinds of special treatment graduating that year, just because of the time frame of 100 years had passed. Um, but I do think having grown up in such an isolated area where I didn't feel any different and my parents um, supported any direction I went in, you know, I was very, I, I did, you know, the sports, I did the music, I did the choir, I did all that stuff and graduated valedictorian in my class and got accepted to whatever university I tried to. And eventually I learned, wow, if I really want to get something, if you check off, tick off that little square that says you're Native American, more doors open up for you. And I have told my own kids, I said, if you can use that to your benefit, I said, always put it down. I said, because right now a lot of schools are pushing for having diversity. Mm -hmm. yes. And I said, be part of that diversity, you know, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. I said, it's really going to work to your benefit. Mm -hmm. So out of my seven kids, my older three, um, they know some of the words. Um, I'm still in contact with them. They've gone on to like engineering, things like that, things I don't understand. <laughs> I was medical. I don't understand anything with engineering. But um, they, they represent, um, to mention my, my daughter, Rebecca, who's 23, when she was in high school down in, in um, Montlake Terrace, Washington. And my dad had moved down to live close to us when we lived in Linwood. And he's walking down the street and he's got his carved cane and his indigenous vest on. And he's wearing a fox fur hat. And he's just walking down the street and her school bus goes by. And this made me so proud. She said all the kids started making fun of him and imitating and talking about his hat. And she stood up on the bus and she says, that's my grandfather you're talking about. He's Simpson. She goes, you have no right to stand up not knowing who this person is and his history to make fun of him. I heard this after the fact, and I could not have been prouder of my daughter for standing up and defending her grandfather. And I had to tell my dad this and my father um, is proud now because he's a retired fire chief. And my 23 year old daughter is now a firefighter oh, wow. down in Washington state. So I'm like, wow. I said, you, you're following in your grandfather's footsteps. I said, this is amazing. I grew up around fire halls, which is why I got into medical. You know, I took all his EMT, ETT courses he taught and found I liked that sort of thing. And I said, this is fantastic. Wow. She said, yeah, I want to be a first responder. I'm like, great. Wow. So you are a true blessing, Karen. <laughs> true yes. blessing. And so grateful for who you are and what you're giving to your own communities and our communities. I think um, that's just fabulous. You've, you've taught me so much today. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Oh, I love talking about the stuff and, and the cultures. And yeah. um, like I said, I'm, I'm constantly educating myself on uh, the Métis traditions and how those come up. Cause I, I don't feel I should be, you know, trying to talk to families. Um, I'm the cultural support worker with Métis Family Services and I don't feel comfortable talking about something I don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. I, I know everything about the indigenous background I came from. Mm -hmm. So I spend my lunch hours in my office watching videos and following, you know, whatever I can find that will educate me more on you know, the Métis background, mm -hmm. which is why I also now um, try to recognize it in my, uh, my opening statement, mm -hmm. because I think uh, they're, they're trying very hard to gain that recognition over the years. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, we will, I just so incredibly grateful that you, the next two days at the Gratitude and Appreciation Summits, that we're doing virtually that you'll be bringing the blessing from our uh, from the elders to open up our two-day summit and that on saturday you're going to be leading us through a, a workshop as well 
So yeah. we're incredibly like on thankful Thursday reflections. Um, this is a reflection of the past a reflection that we're going to have today going forward and how together the like we we all we all are changing the world just a little bit at a time a little bit as Kathy loves to say one person at a time um and you're a very important one person uh to me in my life and Kathy's life so we just want to say a big thank you we're all wearing our it's interesting we all have different yes this is my shirts. dog my daughter's design she won our, a contest in Langley back in 2017 so we always pull out her shirts on orange shirt day <laughs> So just beautiful. Any any parting wisdom for us that something you're thankful for today, Karen, on Thankful Thursday Reflections? I'm thankful for my family. Uh, it's so funny. I can talk to people about my education, where I came from, but it seems the thing that, that throws people for a loop is the fact I am the mom of seven children, um, ages 10 up through 27. Um, I am uh, a hardworking mom. I, I've changed careers over the process. I'm very happy in what I'm doing now. I love working with people. And I feel that um, if you're in a position to help somebody, help them. I, I've been in a position where I needed the help and the Langley community was just amazing. And I started connecting with a lot of the resources and I've helped people I've just met. Um, they know who they are. I don't talk about a lot of the things that I do volunteer wise because I'm not doing that for, you know, getting the little pat on the back. Oh, you're so great. That's, that's not why I do most of the things that I do. I, it makes my life feel um, worth living. I really, really enjoy making people happy. Um, that's how I met Jeanette years ago. She and I hit it off so well. We've been kind of unstoppable since then. Um, I just like surrounding myself with positive people. And, you know, even if you don't have the ability to help somebody, just talking to them and saying, hi, I'm so-and-so, how's your day going? You know, because a lot of people are going through things we don't even know they're going through. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So Kathy, yes, go be kind. Yes. <laughs> Love it. <For> our kindest <laughs> adventures. So, Kathy, uh, shall we send out some extra, extra kindness? So Absolutely. we always end thankful Thursday reflections. Karen, we put our right hands together over our hearts. We warm them up. We do a half a heart, half a heart, put our hearts together. We're going to pump it five times today. One, two, three, four, five. Kindness out to the world on Wonderful. this incredibly special day. I love um, you, ladies. Uh, you guys are great. <laughs> Truth and reconciliation. Thank you so much, Karen, for being yep. our extra special guest today. We'll see you over the next two days as well. Yes, you will. Great. Thanks for having me. Bye. <laughs> Bye.